I called it uh, the best show of the summer because I had seen a lot of the other st- summer stuff, and I just I had no idea that it was going to wind up being uh, the best series, in my opinion, of the year. Hello, friend. You're listening to Decrypted, Ars Technica's new podcast all about Mr. Robot. This week, we'll catch you up on Season 1 and chat with NPR's TV critic Eric Deggins about why Mr. Robot's the best show on TV and what might be in store for Season 2. Nathan Matthijs here with Ars Technica. You're listening to Decrypted. When I tell people that I'm involved with the podcast, they get excited. But when I say it's about Mr. Robot, there's a surprising amount of, wait, what's that? She's trolling me. Describing this show to the uninitiated has been mm, complicated. Fight Club mixed with war games is kind of kitschy and dated. But if you bring up anonymous or bipolar heroes, people seem to roll their eyes. Plus, if you're trying to recruit people to watch the show with you, you can't just give the plot away. Hollywood hacker bullshit. I've been in this game 27 years, not once have I ever come across an animated singing virus. In the spirit of helping others catch up without straight recapping, I thought maybe we should let the show do the talking. Here are four clips straight from Elliot's mouth that'll get you ready for season two. I like coming here because... Your Wi-Fi was fast. I mean, you're one of the few spots that has a fiber connection with gigabit speed. It's good. It's so good, it scratched that part of my mind. The part that doesn't allow good to exist without condition. So I started intercepting all the traffic on your network. That's when I noticed something strange. That's when I decided to hack you. Ever hear of Ron's Coffee? Well, this scene early in the first episode tells you why this probably fictional business, soon went downhill fast. Elliot Alderson is not a superhero, but for all intents and purposes, he has a super ability, and that is his technical prowess. Okay, James Bond, let's go mess this shit up. Boom, boom. The dude can hack just about anything, and here he explains to the poor coffee shop owner that tour networking does not guarantee anonymous servers. Whoever controls the exit nodes controls the traffic, he says. And then Elliot proceeds to pwn this poor overmatched man. You need some new shoes. Those won't do anymore. This is just the first of many. The outcomes don't always go as planned, but the hacks certainly seem to. But despite Elliot being some type of hacker ninja, he wouldn't be nearly as successful if he didn't also possess a sneaky second ability. Steel Mountain. Nothing is actually impenetrable. A place like this says it is, and it's close. But people still built this place. And if you can hack the right person, all of a sudden you have a piece of powerful malware. People always make the best exploits. For as bad as Elliot says he is at social interactions, and mind you, he's bad, there's plenty of evidence. First 10 seconds were uncomfortable. He is great at social engineering. And what really makes Mr. Robot Sing as an accurate depiction of hacking is that the show does not skimp on the amount of research necessary to pull off some of these big hacks. Bill Harper is our first exploit. He isn't going to give us search much scrutiny. He'll get us level one, but Bill is not going to be able to get us level two. We need to get to level two. You just heard Elliot and the F Society gang getting ready to go into a giant digital data protection fortress, but they're able to succeed because of weeks and weeks and weeks of research. Where some other shows may depict hacking as a few clicks and then you're done, Mr. Robot never shies away from the amount of legwork it takes. If you died, would anyone care? The few people that would feel obligated to go to your funeral would probably be annoyed and leave as early as possible. Ugh, morbid. But, spoiler alert, effective. And as most Ars Technica readers would tell you, That's why social engineering remains one of the most potent forms of hacking. I think there's this one. Um, it's really corny, but it has everything. The kids and the... Shayla's bug was always elusive to me. Maybe this was it. Wanting normalcy, but stuck in the outer fringes. Not knowing how to participate. Just like me. I kiss you. 
The third thing you need to know about Elliot is not that he's an unreliable narrator like Frank Underwood on the House of Cards. Instead, Elliot is actually quite self-aware as a narrator. It's just he can't always overcome his limitations. When a bug finally makes itself known, it can be exhilarating. You just heard Shayla and Elliot in a room together where Elliot accurately recognizes he has a longing to fit in and he feels constantly like an outsider. This motivates a ton of his hacks. He's either trying to get closer to people and learn more about them, or he's looking to help out people he already feels close to. Unfortunately for everyone involved, sometimes that gets complicated fast. I know you don't feel like talking about it. You're right, I don't. As a viewer, this is great. Elliot's limitations endear him to us. He feels more vulnerable. He feels more realistic and not just like some superhero in a black hoodie. Unfortunately, for people involved in the plot, it's not always a great thing. So, no spoilers, but don't get too attached to Shayla. You want to talk about reality? We haven't lived in anything remotely close to it since the turn of the century. We turned it off, took out the batteries, snacked on a bag of GMOs while we... Tossed the remnants in the ever-expanding dumpster of the human condition. We live in branded houses, trademarked by corporations, built on bipolar numbers. For our final must-know from season one, which... Pause for a second. If you don't know that that voice is kinda sorta Elliot, how did you make it this far? And stop the podcast now. But... Let's talk about the grand ideas behind Elliot's actions and motivations in Season 1. Mr. Robot deals with a lot, a lot of current and prescient issues. The wealth distribution gap, our obsession with digital realities and crafting these alternate and second identities for each of us, our reliance on big corporations or governments or other large faceless entities that impact our day-to-day -day life, our vitals, things like health and happiness. I don't know who you think you're talking to, but I'll try the Pradas next. F Society, specifically, Elliot's Hacker Group, is about tearing down these walls so that people can see reality again. Their saying is, I am awake, we are awake. And Mr. Robot as a whole is about examining some of these things. Or at least season one is. Season two? Who knows what's in store? But pay attention to what Elliot says closely. Even if he isn't quite aware of what he's doing, there's a good chance he'll let us know what's really happening. Up next on Decrypted, our interview with NPR TV critic Eric Deggins. But first... Word from our corporate overlords! From the moment you start your day, to the moment you drift off in bed, we're all around you. We're in the cards in your wallet that let you live your life your way. We're in your computer, watching your children and keeping your information safe. We're high overhead in orbit, helping bring the world nearer to you. And we're with you at the supper table like part of your family. We're E-Corp, and we're everywhere for you. Anyone who follows the increased amount of TV criticism over the past decade is probably familiar with our next guest. Eric Deggins is a longtime TV critic whose voice can be heard on a variety of NPR programs. Last year, amid what was, by all accounts, a great run of television, personal favorites including, oh, say, Fargo Season 2, Deggins found himself surprisingly enraptured with Mr. Robot. And now you're going to talk about this in the world? It soon became one of his hits of the summer, and later when he put together his best of 2015 list, Mr. Robot sat up top. He's getting ready to review season two for NPR, but Deggins found a little bit of time to talk with ours about all things Mr. Robot. <laughs> well, I know this voice as the man who guides many of my viewing decisions through NPR's Morning Edition, but NPR's TV critic Eric Deggins... Thanks for taking some time out of your day. Oh, thanks for having me. <laughs> it is my pleasure. Now, I wanted to have you on because you are a big Mr. Robot fan. It was your number one TV show in 2015 when it came yep. down to year-end lists. So let's start with the easy question. How did you come about finding the show? 
the great thing about being a TV critic is that the TV um, networks want you to find their shows. <laughs> so basically, uh, USA Network uh, reached out and made uh, review copies available. I, I will uh, sheepishly admit that it, uh, I, I didn't really start watching the show until it, it had already debuted um, because there, there's just uh, so much programming these days. And I um, hadn't heard a lot of advanced buzz about Mr. Robot, so I figured, well, um, I didn't get around to watching it before it aired, but, you know, it, it will air, and then I'll uh, catch up with it afterwards. And there was so much buzz after it, after it actually debuted, and people saw how good it was. And I think in particular, uh, Rami Malek's character, that's such a unique character. We haven't seen a character like that on television before, and we had no idea how unique he really was in the first few episodes. Um, but even what we saw there was so special that I think people really responded to it. So so uh, after the show debuted, I sort of caught up to it, and I wound up doing a review um, that I think ran maybe the week after it debuted or something like that, where I, I called it uh, the best show of the summer um, because I had seen a lot of the other st- summer stuff. And I just I had no idea that it was going to wind up being – uh, the best uh, series, in my opinion, of the year. But once the storyline played out, it was obvious. <laughs> I think that's one of the themes with season one of Mr. Robot. Surprise. It caught everyone off surprise, whether you're talking about Malik's performance in particular, whether you're talking about people catching up to the show late. I myself definitely binged through season one. Um, kind of towards the end of the season, I really caught up with all the critical buzz that was going on. You know, what do you, in your reviews, you talked about how the show, even though it uses some ideas you might have seen elsewhere, you know, the obvious Fight Club comparisons, or you brought up The Matrix, do you think it's Malik's performance that really helps it, even though there are some old ideas at play, feel brand new? Or are there other aspects of the show as well that makes it stand out for you? Well, I actually think the, the overriding um, the reason why the show is so successful at surprising people and it feels so revolutionary is the storytelling that the creator Sam Esmail uses. Um, he tells the story in a way that's very unconventional. Um, and that gives Rami Malek sort of the room to reinvent this character in a way that we haven't seen before. I mean, uh, you know, you, you talked about my comparison to The Matrix. You know, Keanu Reeves, uh, um, Neo, uh, when we first meet him in the first movie, is is a lot like Elliot uh, Alderson is Rami Malek's character in that they both are kind of stuck in um, positions in life where they're kind of numb to their circumstances and they have a sense that there's something, there's some greater purpose that they're, that they're going to be a part of, but they're not quite sure what it is or how to engage it and all of that. Um, but but Rami Malek plays this character as much more insightful, and he, he has much more agency than Neo does when we first meet him. So um, so it feels fresh, even though it's a type of character that we've seen before. And and I feel like the the way that Sam tells the story, um, he he always brings storylines to you in ways that you don't expect. Um, he walks you up to big developments in the story and then won't per- portray them on the screen. You know, we, the, 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 whole, you know the whole series is building to this huge hack that they're going to do to kind of bring down uh, the world's economic system. And we don't even see when it happens. <laughs> you know, we, don't, we don't even see them do it. And so, um, you know, th- this, you know, if you watch the very first episode, you can see that he has a way of parsing out the story and making revelations to you and laying down breadcrumbs that will mean something later in a way that that nobody else does on television. And that's what made the show so exciting. If you were to actually sort of tell people the plot, um, other than the stuff I think involving um, Elliot's character, which is very unique, I think. We haven't seen that on television before. But if you were to lay out the basics of the rest of the plot um, to to somebody... um, you know, it wouldn't sound that interesting, but when you <laughs> watch it, when you see it, when you see how he tells the story, um, it, it's something else entirely. Yeah. Well, and I want to say but another one of the things that at least made people like myself and, and Ars Technica latch onto the show is, you know, not only was it great narrative, great storytelling, 
but they got all the technical details right. And in an internet age where people are examining everything that's happening in the background, that kind of opened the show up to a whole nother area of fandom. And I wanted to ask you, as a person who watches all TV, not just shows that are depicting very technical and computer-oriented things, how do you think the show does and how has it struck its balance depicting this super technical information in a very accurate light, but you need no technical background to really enjoy the show? Right, yeah. I, you know, I think that kind of stuff is really more about um, giving viewers who watch the show the feeling that that what they're seeing is 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 grounded in reality like you can't i think a lot of times with viewers you can't necessarily point to something um you know i i did a i did a piece um um earlier this week um uh, well i guess i shouldn't say it that way i did a piece for npr hmm. about a showtime series called roadies and um I think there a lot of people came to that show. It got it, it's by Cameron Crowe. It's about um, you know roadies who work for a rock band, and it, it got pummeled in the press. And I think people come to that show and they watch it and they have some sense that it's just inauthentic. It just doesn't feel like some. It doesn't feel like they're depicting anything that's grounded in reality. And if most people can't tell you why it's inauthentic. Uh, I did a piece where I talked to a bunch of real roadies who told me why it was inauthentic, but but I don't I don't think the average viewer knows why it's inauthentic. They just know that they watch it and they don't buy it. And I feel like with Mr. Robot, because they got those details right, the average viewer, I'd say, you know, eighty percent of the viewers are not going to know how technically accurate the computer stuff is. But what they know is that when they watch it, it feels right. It feels like something that could happen. And, and that makes, when they do have to cross the line and do something that's unrealistic, it makes it easier for you to buy it because there's not so much more that you have to put up with before you get to that moment where it's like, okay, they can't really crash the world's computer systems. <laughs> you know? So, um, so that's, you know, and I think a lot of, of high-quality shows are like that. You know, they, they do, um, you know, The Wire did that. You know, they, they do the homework so right. that the viewer doesn't have to. And the viewer can just experience whatever it is, um, the, the, the story that they're being told, and they can relax and enjoy it because there aren't these little things in the back of their head saying, you know, oh, man, that wouldn't happen. Oh, man, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> oh, man, that doesn't feel right. And then by the time you get to the big thing that you have to accept, you've already uh, been sort of constantly kept from a state of being able to accept the story so when you get to that big moment you don't buy it um i mean it's it's weird to say it but like uh and i'm going to digress a lot you can just edit whatever you want but (laughs) but, you know i was watching the the, i was watching they put out a new deluxe edition of the superman versus uh the batman versus superman movie and and Mm -hmm. one of the things that struck me about it was that uh in the condensed version that was in theaters there were a ton of those moments because they edited out stuff that would explain things so um, so you were constantly saying to yourself, well, why is that happening? Or what, you know, and you weren't saying it consciously. It was in the back of your mind. Why did that happen? What's going on here? I don't understand that. Why did that, you know? And so then when you get to the big moments where you have to accept that these two superheroes have decided to fight each other to the, to the death for some reason, uh, you don't buy it as much because right. all this other stuff has kept you questioning the story the whole time you've been experiencing it. So what's great about Mr. Robot is that and, and, and any really well-made TV show that's grounded in reality is that they know that if they get the small things right, then that voice in your head doesn't go off. And then when you get to the big moment where you have to accept something, you accept it. We're not worried about spoilers in the first season, are we, in this conversation? No, no, no. Go so, ahead. <laughs> so, so when you get to that moment where you discover that Christian Slater is not real, you, you you're not – I mean, part of you is sort of thinking, oh, now I want to go back and watch all the moments when he was in the show to see if other people reacted to him. But when that moment happens, you kind of buy it as opposed to if they hadn't really done it well. The whole time you'd be like, what's up with that guy? What's up with that guy? And then when they were killed, you'd be like, oh, you know, it it wouldn't have been a big thing. So that's why it's so important to get those small things right because it it keeps you grounded and and, and engaged in the story. And I think – you know, lesser shows and lesser movies don't understand how important that is. Even when you're, even when the subject of the, of the movie or TV show is really fantastical. 
you put your finger on that better than I ever could. <laughs> Um, I know your time is limited. You're a busy guy, but I want to at least ask you about season two. You know, you don't have to reveal anything because I know you've got a review coming in the works. Yep. But it, there's a lot more hype going into season two, whereas season one snuck up on everybody. So, what are you most excited about, or what are you looking forward to the most early in season two? Well, you know, uh, of course, what's most exciting, uh, given what I said about the creator Sam Esmail, is that. You know, he now has more control over this next season. Um, I think he's written and directed every episode. Yeah, it sounded like he wanted to go, yeah, the, the true detective route or the Fargo route where you are really taking your vision and implementing it. Well, I mean, it's interesting because, like, these British dramas that people really like, um, th that's what they do. I mean, in the British TV system, they don't make that many episodes of a show, and there's generally one or two people who write it all and direct it all. Uh, and so, you know, you can have a Luther, and you can have a Broadchurch, and you can have The Fall, and, you know, you can have all these great shows uh, that have a singular point of, of vision because, you know, a very small group of people made it all from beginning to end. And, and so they seem to be trying to do that with Mr. Robot, but, you know, you're talking about a show that's you know, 10 or 13 episodes. I forget mm -hmm. how long the season's going to be. And then, so that's a much more garga gargantuan task. Um, so, so I mean, I mean, basically, when you, when you give a creator more room, you can either get what happened in Fargo, where Noah Hawley crafted an amazing second season that was better than the first, or you can get True Detective, uh, where the creator of that show went off the rails. <laughs> um, and, and, and so my big question about Mr. Robot is which one is it going to be? Do we get Fargo or do we get True Detective? And uh, <laughs> I've seen the first two episodes and they're promising. Uh, but, you know, the way Mr. Robot is, you, you can't really know in two episodes. Oh, totally. Thinking back to season one, the show took so many twists. Once you even, even early on, but episode three, episode four, things got crazy. I didn't, for instance, expect uh, Fernando the prison guy to come back and he turned out to be a huge part of the plot for season one so <laughs> right. this is exciting that you think season two looks promising so far yeah yeah and uh i'm involved with choosing the peabody awards and so mr robot won one and so you know sam and rami and some other folks from the show were there uh and so i did get a chance to spend some time with rami and talk to him a little bit about the process and, and, you know, he said first season was sort of this process where him and Sam were learning to trust each other because they were making something that's very unconventional and it demanded very different things from both him as an actor and um, the production team. Um, they were going into uncharted territory. And so they had to learn how to trust each other. And by the end of that process in the first season, they had gotten there. And so for him, it was exciting to begin um, the, the second season in that place where, um, you know, they had worked together, they created something special, um, they knew they were on the right track, and now it was just about sort of continuing that great working relationship. So um, so that, you know, for me, as, a, as an educated fan, um, that I'll be looking for that too, just seeing the partnership between Rami and Sam kind of uh, get closer and what, what does that produce. Well, you're only making me more excited for season two, so July 13th can't come soon enough. Uh, Eric Deggins, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for sharing some insight on Mr. Robot. No problem. Thank you. That's it for the first episode of Decrypted. Tune in next week when, well, Mr. Robot finally starts airing. We'll have two episodes to talk about as USA announced a back-to-back -back season premiere on July 13th. Make sure you're following Decrypted wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, or directly through RSS. If you got questions, comments, or thoughts, feel free to reach out to us, either through the Ars Technica forums or via email, social at arstechnica.com. Just put Mr. Robot in the subject line. Thanks again this week to NPR's TV critic Eric Deggins and our music friends at the Audio Network. We're all excited to see what happens. Come back next week and we'll chat about it. Until then... Thank you for a lovely evening.